Hi, I'm Dr. Yosef with Daring. It's my pleasure to be joined by Sumer here. He has a condition called PFS, which is post finasteride syndrome. He's kindly agreed to come on and share his story. Uh, so thank you for being here. And I'm, I'm going to turn it over to you, uh, Sumer. Tell us, uh, how did, what, what happened to you? How did this all begin? Just, just walk us through it from, from start to end. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate you uh, giving us patience this, this platform. Um, mm -hmm. So basically, my, my experience with this started in, well, maybe I have to rewind a little bit. So I got mm -hmm. this through a company called HIMSS. Um, they are a, a telehealth company uh, in the United States. I'm not sure if they're, they have any operations internationally, but they're pretty big here. And, um, you know, uh, basically they, their whole spiel is that they provide consumers with different medications, um, hair loss. Uh, they started doing like anxiety and depression and things like that. And, um, you know, I really started uh, getting exposed to their advertising from a pretty young age, you know, they started popping up on my feed when I was like, you know, 17, you know, just fresh out of high school. So it was kind of something that like, not to sound over dramatic, but was almost like implanted in my mind from, mm -hmm. from an early age. Um, so basically what happened is, um, you know, I'm not currently experiencing any sort of extreme hair loss or I wasn't at the time. But, um, you know, all of my male, you know, family members, so my, my father, both of my grandfathers, and even my uncle on my mom's side uh, are experiencing some level of hair loss. Um, so it was always sort of something that I was aware of in a way, you know, kind of cognizant mm -hmm. of from, from an early state. Um, so, you know, uh, I'm 21 right now. And I was 21 when I decided to to start this drug, and I was basically just looking for, you know, what, what my options were to kind of uh, mitigate this. Because obviously, you know, as a man, your hair is something that's important to you. It's important to your to your self confidence. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so I, uh, you know, based on the marketing that was presented to me from an early age, you know, I sought out the drug um, and. Uh, you know, they told me that I could take uh, topical or use rather topical finasteride. Mm -hmm. And I presented to them with uh, a history of some some mental disorders. You know, I, I had some level of OCD and ADHD and things like that. So they said, you know, based on this, we will uh, prescribe you the topical formulation because it has a lower uh, risk of side effects. And, uh, you know, from there, I, I thought I had nothing to lose. I mean, really the biggest thing that they highlighted with this drug was, you know, was scalp irritation. And, you know, I decided to apply this. I applied it maybe a total of four times and it's completely wrecked, you know, so many different aspects of my life, just all of a sudden, you know? Yeah. And so the, the topical that's, um, finasteride mixed with minoxidil. Is that the combination? Correct. Okay. Yeah. That's what okay. they sell. Mm -hmm. And so when you got, so you went on, when you went onto their website, like, and I've played around on there since talking to Eric. Um, does it push you in one way or another, to, you know, to, does it, to, to oral finasteride or to the topical? What do you re recall about kind of your experience kind of going through that? Right. So I basically went on their app and on there, you know, it's kind of presented like almost like a, an online marketplace, really. Um, mm -hmm. So, you, you know, you have like a listing for a drug. So they've got a listing for oral finasteride and topical finasteride and all their anxiety pills and things like that. You select what you as a consumer think you want. And then the, you know, a provider gets in contact with you based on that. And they pr provide their suggestion or whatever they're willing to prescribe you. Okay. And so I'm going to go back later on to, to the process of getting this medication, but I think it's good to actually just go straight into you took it for four days or four doses or whatever it was. What did what did you start notice uh, noticing happening after you started using the product? Right. Um, so one of the things I think with PFS is that a lot of mm. people um, like to discount it as you know just side effects or you know the the nocebo effect or, or what what have you, right? Um, but the thing with me was that first of all I didn't even know the 
full extent of, of any side effects. I mean, all they really told me um, was, you know, scalp irritation is common. Like I said, they did provide me a link, you know, that kind of went deeper into the side effects. I just did a cursory glance over that because it was like, you know, it, 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 it said scalp irritation, you know, minor things. And then like every other drug, they have the contact your doctor immediately if these things happen, right? And almost every mm -hmm. drug has that. So it didn't occur to me as something that was, you know, really serious. Um, but yeah, so I, I applied the drug, um, you know, to, I think, like I said, my head four times. And uh, almost immediately, like on the second day, I just started, started noticing like this horrible, like burning in my genitals, just immediate. Um, nothing else had changed at that point in my, in my lifestyle and what I was using. It was just that finasteride um, that I had applied. And, you know, and that how was frequently really just, do, you, do you use the topical? Is it once a month? Is it once, how, like, how do they advise you to use it? Um, so yeah, basically they said, just use it once a day, either in the morning okay. or at night. And yeah, okay. I, I applied it in the morning for, for about four days. Okay. Okay, so you immediately notice burning in your genitals. Um, mm -hmm. What what did you what did you make of that? Because because that's it that's that's at your second dose, and then you did a couple more after that. Was it kind of tricky to put it together until that fourth dose? Really, what was happening? Yeah, so it was a little bit weird because you know I I it kind of the genital burning started rather quickly, but it wasn't something that was immediately sort of noticeable or like something that I need to act upon right away it kind of came, sure. it sort of intensified gradually over those four days. So the first day, like I said, everything was pretty much fine. The second day, you know, um, it was, it was mild, you know, I didn't, it, I, I was starting to register it, but I wasn't like, I was like, okay, new medication, you know, things can happen. By the third day, it was pretty bad. Um, and then, um, you know, by the fourth day, I'm like, okay, I need to, uh, you know, speak to someone about this. So I, I um, texted my HIMSS provider on the app and I told her like, hey, is this, is this normal? Is this supposed to happen? And she was like, no, that's not a normal symptom. She kind of like, you know, it, I mean, I, I don't know what else she could have done online, but it felt like she kind of shooed me off. Like she was just like, you know, go see a, go see a medical provider in person. Um, mm. and, and get that figured out, stop the medication. Um, so this was actually on, I want to say this was like on a Friday night that I, I texted or something like that. So there wasn't like anything necessarily open, but by mm -hmm. that next Saturday, that next day I had, I had stopped the medication and it had gotten so terrible that, you know, I was, I had to take like ibuprofen. It, it was awful. And I was like, I can't really wait till Monday. So I, I, you know, got to urgent care and, um, at urgent care, you know, I was, I was really worried at this point and I told them what I took and I told them, you know, how much I used and, you know, she, I could tell she didn't necessarily know a lot about this drug. Um, but the sort of the practitioner there at urgent care just looked it up and she said, well, it says here that sexual side effects can happen. And she was like, you know, give it a week or so. If it doesn't get better, you can come back. Um, but uh, I think you should be fine. And so, yeah, I left it for about a week after that. Okay. And so what did you notice when that week was over? Right. So the, the, the burning sensation, um, you know, kind of stopped um, pretty quickly after that point. Um, in a matter of like a couple of days. Um, and, uh, you know, honestly, after I, after I had gone to urgent care, um, you know, I remember this very vividly because I was really, really worried at that point. I was like, this isn't, something isn't right. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I went to urgent care, thought everything was okay. I was really glad to hear that, you know, nothing was wrong, that maybe this was normal. And, you know, this, this kind of sticks in my brain because I, um, you know, I was at school at the time and this was actually like Halloween. I don't remember if it was Halloween day or Halloween weekend. And that, of course, is a really big thing in like a college town. 
Um, so yeah, I went out that night. I was having fun with my friends and things like that. But uh, you know, I had no idea what was about to what was about to come in the next mm-hmm. next few days there. So I stopped the drug. You know, the burning stopped, but eventually, all of a sudden, I noticed this new um, sexual dysfunction that just seemingly cropped up out of nowhere. Um, and it was very jarring, you know, because, I mean, I'm 21 years old, you know, and I had never experienced no, any... No medical problems, not on any other drugs or medications or anything like that? No, I mean, I had been on antidepressants for a little while, but at that point, I wasn't taking them. So how long had you been off for? Uh, I want to say at that point I had been off for, for a couple weeks. Um, so Mm -hmm. I'd recently stopped antidepressants as well. Um, Mm -hmm. but throughout my whole, I mean, antidepressants, I mean, PSSD is a whole nother thing, but for Mm -hmm. me, um, personally, I didn't have necessarily adverse reactions to them because I'd been taking them since I was 15 or 16, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so, so, you know, I, I didn't really attribute it, uh, to that. Um, sure. so yes. Yeah, okay. so, so, um, I stopped the drug and, um, yeah, all of a sudden, you know, I've got this, this sexual dysfunction that came out of nowhere. And, and, uh, and if you're comfortable describing it, cause I think this is a, this is kind of interesting to hear, um, um, yeah. How do you describe it? You know, because there's everything from genital genital anesthesia, numbness, you know, you know, increased difficulty maintaining an erection, extremely muted orgasms. There's a, mm-hmm. and, and sometimes even like physical changes people have described as well. So if you, if you feel comfortable doing that, you can say, no, please do if you don't. But I, I think it's always good to kind of characterize it um, um, because I, I do think it's unique from other forms of sexual dysfunction, such as, you know, you know, things that may happen due to cardiovascular disease and other things like that. Right. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. It was, um, so the first thing that, that I kind of noticed was that I just didn't, it was just this sexual like apathy, right. Mm-hmm. Which was so strange. Like I just didn't care all of a sudden. Um, and you know, this wasn't necessarily, so this was kind of, this sexual apathy came up kind of in that acute um, period of like a week after I, I stopped. Um, okay. But something that was more gradual was like physical changes. And, you know, obviously I'm not going to go into like super vivid detail with that, but it was, it was like, it was really jarring and just very weird. It was like almost like atrophy of that area. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And that has, has persisted. Okay. And, um, any, um, any changes in, um, sensation? Cause I've heard some people describe like you lose erogenous sensation. I know that's a uh, PSSD that that's very common in PSSD, uh, mm-hmm. where, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll go, you know, they'll touch down there and it feels like they're touching the back of their, their, their arm or something like that. It doesn't feel like you're touching, you know, uh, sexual skin. Right. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I haven't even paid much attention to that. Mm-hmm. That hasn't occupied. It's very possible. Um, but mm-hmm. the thing is, like, the physical changes that have happened were so jarring and, like, so just shocking that I almost haven't even paid attention or had mm-hmm. a chance to pay attention to, um, fit, like, uh, changes in sensation, if, if that makes sense, you know? Okay. And I guess since that time... Um... Have you been able to to have an orgasm, or uh, and you know if if so, if that has happened, what what's the quality been like? Because I've also heard things about changes in uh, qu- the quality of the semen, the changes in the quality of the orgasm uh, during these conditions. I don't know if you could talk a little bit about how things changed before and after. Right. Um, so you know, I guess I'm 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 lucky in that you know I don't have complete impotence or anything like that, and I can. Mm-hmm you know, function, like theoretically function in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it is so, it it almost, I don't know if this sounds bad, but it almost doesn't matter because it's like, I don't respond to like, it's almost like that part of my brain has been just ripped out. You know what I mean? I just don't care. I don't, uh, seek those sort of things out. Um, and, um, 
you know, the physical, the physical changes are, you know, like I said, they're pretty almost traumatic in their own right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, you know, uh, uh, apart from that, even, even things, there's so many indications that something is not right. Like the complete loss of nocturnal erections or spontaneous erections or things like that. It's just completely, honestly, the best way to describe it is like the, the human sexuality that I've known my whole life has just been completely obliterated and ripped out of my body. You know, it's just not there. You know, I've heard some people say where, you know, it's like, where, whereas, you know, seeing someone they would be attracted to would induce arousal in the past, you know, following this, it's like they could be looking at a rock or a tree. It's just like, it's just kind of like shut down. There's not that attraction anymore, you know, you know, viewing pornographic material, it's just nothing, you know, there's, there's nothing that used to be there before. Um, so right. that would, that would fit with what I've heard before. Another thing that I, I want to ask you about is, did you find that this apathy that you, you know, which is obviously very obvious when it comes to uh, sexual attraction and things like that, did you see it spill over into other areas of um, emotional connectedness and sensation, whether it's interacting with others, you know, with friends, with family, you know, feeling, uh, I don't know, joy or motivation with work, you know, just the, the whole other kind of dimension of emotion. I was wondering if you could kind of talk, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say, you know, apart from, you know, I'm a pretty severe case sexually, um, between mm -hmm. everything that's happened here, but also, you know, um, I've, I've experienced a lot of other changes as well. Um, and one of those things is, is, um, it's, it's gotten better over time, but I had a really severe case of anhedonia for a while. Um, and that was really, really scary. Um, it, like the first couple months that I was in this situation, I mean, I could not get enjoyment out of anything. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it was just like this, I, I think Eric described it as like a biochemically induced depression that wasn't you. And that's what it was for you know, those first couple months after getting off this medication. Um, since then, like I said, you know, things have, have improved somewhat and they've stabilized a little bit, but it is in no way um, even close to a full, normal human experience. Um, one of the best examples is um, I was a really, really huge music fan. Um, and I know every, most people love music, yeah. right? But the thing was, is that I was one of those people who was like constantly listening to music. You know, I loved to attend concerts. I was really into like kind of niche areas of music. Like I really loved like psychedelic rap and things like that. You know, I was a vinyl co collector for a little while, mm -hmm. constantly listening to music, right? Almost 24 seven, no matter what I'm doing. All of a sudden, you know, I can't like, I can't listen to music anymore. It doesn't do anything for me. Um, it's, it's like listening to anything else, you know, what I, it's just like, I'm listening to the news or a podcast or something like that. There's not that sense of euphoria is completely just stripped away. Um, okay. yeah, it's like, I'll, I'll be driving in the car. Normally I'd be, you know, jamming out to some music and I, I just don't listen anymore because it, it doesn't do anything. Yeah. Um, Another thing has been definitely, I think, just that general sense of, of reward that you get from life. Um, you know, um, I have to be honest, I mean, my social life has definitely taken a hit due to this because that sense of enjoyment that you get when you're with your friends and when you're out and about or you're going out to a, going out to a party and meeting people, it's just gone, you know, um, mm -hmm. independently and independently of that sexual uh those sexual problems, but those also present, uh, I think a major issue just in functioning, functioning in society. Right. Because you know what I mean? It's like, I'm going out, you know, uh, I got one more semester of college uh, basically. And you know, the whole thing is like, right. You go out at night, you know, you hope maybe you'll meet, you know, a new sure. partner and, yeah. you know, maybe try dating some new people that, that part of you is just gone. So it's almost like, you know, you just don't, You've, you've lost a piece of yourself. And like I was saying about, about music, I mean, there's, there's so many other examples of that um, in my life. Um, another thing 
and this was very, very noticeable, is, so I had some mild ADHD. Um, it wasn't necessarily, you know, um, like I had some problems focusing, but it was it was more so that that pattern of hyperfixation that a lot of uh, people with ADHD, you know, have, and that was very noticeable from a very young age. Um, and you know, it sounds like a bad thing, but that was a really core part of my personality where I would like find this new thing, whether it be, you know, like a new album or a new mm -hmm. movie, or a new video game, or a book, or whatever, whatever, right? And I just get so immersed in it for like yeah. a month, right? And then I move on to the next thing. But I'm like totally obsessed with this thing and it's so cool and I suck all the dopamine out of it. That pattern has yeah. existed since I was three yeah. years old. And all of a sudden, that just completely stopped. Like I don't care about these things anymore. It's it's really, it's kind of harrowing, you know? Sure. And um, what's it been like having to study, you know, when you've... I, I, cause it sounds like motivation has taken a hit. I, I, I mean, I don't know, like, is it hard to find the motivation to do anything now? Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So I think that's, that's another area where I think I'm, I'm relatively lucky or as lucky as you can be in a situation like this. Um, because at first, I don't know if you've heard from PFS patients, but we have kind of the the period that we call the crash, right? Where it's just sudden mm -hmm. worsening. During that period, you know, I was, um, so this past semester I, I had to do online because I took the medication in October of 2022 and uh, you know, things got really bad. So I was like, I gotta go back home and, and kind of sort this out. So I was studying online and you know, that, that semester kind of lined up uh, with my crash period. And during that, you know, I was just, like I said, I was miserable. I mean, I never want to live through something like that again. Um, Could you describe just for the audience who may not know what the crash is just briefly, what, what are the, what do people typically experience during the crash and w when does it emerge in the, um, I guess in the course of the finasteride injury? Right. Um, so the crash is usually um, very early on um, mm -hmm. after developing those first symptoms. Um, it's, it's, it ranges from like, you know, a week after to maybe like three months after is the, is the longest I've heard. I was kind of on the longer end of the spectrum um, when it comes to that. And I remember, um, I mean, like I said, sudden, just sudden worsening. Um, and it can be in any of the three domains that PFS entails, which is physical, sexual, and neurological. Um it's hard to pinpoint, you know, an exact time where I was like, oh man, this is the crash. Um, but the sexual symptoms started from the very beginning. Like I said, those were immediate. But I remember, um, you know, one day I was just reading a book. This was, I want to say this was like in late December, early January, something like that. I was sitting and reading a book and all of a sudden I just had this intense feeling of like panic. You know, and the thing is, like I said, I've, I've had some level of pre-existing mental health conditions, but I did not have a panic disorder. I did not have, you know, a, you know, a very acute anxiety disorder or anything like that. And, and let me ask you this. When you had anxiety in the past, did it ever affect your sexual function? Not at all. Okay. Uh, that yeah. was, yeah, that, that was something that was completely, uh, you know, almost a completely separate domain from my anxiety or my okay. past struggles, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I was sitting there just literally reading a book and I had this deep sense of like, I don't even know how to dis articulate it correctly, but it was just like, I was reading a book. I was almost realizing it was in that moment that I realized, Hey, I'm reading this book I love and I'm getting nothing out of it. And that scared the crap out of me. And, you know, from then on, I mean, I just, it, it, I've kind of, I guess, like, separated myself from that whole period. Um, but it was so, so abnormal. Um, you know, I was honestly, almost constantly in tears during that period, because I, I, I would think I was just so traumatized by what was happening. Um, you know, so just sudden suicidal ideation, like, serious suicidal ideation that was not an issue for me 
prior to this, you know? So, um, so you just got hit with waves of panic attacks and suicidal thoughts. Um, so it sounds like the first thing was you're reading this book, you go, something is not quite right. And then in the days after, just crazy anxiety, panic attacks, suicidal thoughts. What, what else kind of hit you in this crash? Um, one thing was insomnia. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I... I slept for maybe like two hours a night for like two months. Um, another thing was I started experiencing like heart palpitations and these still occur. I don't know. I know minoxidil, which was in the uh, topical product that I used can cause some problems with the heart. Um, so I don't know if it's attributable to, to that or what, but all of a sudden, you know, just heart palpitations out of nowhere. Um, and yeah, just this overall, just sense of, of complete and utter dread. And it was like, I, I, the thing is, is, you know, I have always been very independent and very, very driven, but all of a sudden I was just struggling to do anything. I mean, I, I, I could barely leave the house. You know, um, it was just so bizarre, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a, I have a theory about, you know, the delayed onset of these toxicities, um, which I'd like to get your thoughts on, because I think it's, it's an interesting pattern, you know, outside of the work I do with the, I guess, PSSD and PFS, PFS folks, I work a lot with uh, benzo injuries and antidepressant injuries a little bit more now. Right. But they, they experience the same pattern, you know, um, of their, you know, they'll go through the acute, you know, the acute symptoms right after the injury. Not always. Sometimes some people just have the severe symptoms right, right from the get go. But it is really common that, you know, somewhere within the three months, things get substantially worse. And I've also seen people who stop medications, you know, they'll stop their antidepressant, they'll feel fine for three months. And then they'll get hit with exactly what you described, you know, the panic and the cognitive problems. And I guess the way I, I, I think about it is, you know, when you come when you're either discontinuing a medication and you've done it too fast or whether you've had an injury such as yours, um, like a toxicity is that the brain maybe has the capacity to accommodate for it, you know, uh, for a certain period right. of time, like it's working double time, you know, it's really trying to keep things kind of going. It knows something's wrong, but at a certain point it can't do it anymore. You know, it, it's just gassed, you know, it, it's tried to kind of keep it together long enough. And then when that system fails and it can no longer, you know, struggle to keep it in balance, um, then you, you fully, the full injury, um, is, um, is, uh, un, un, Un unveiled, uh, un unveiled. Yeah. I mean, that's because that's the only right. way I can really explain that. Because these these delayed onset type uh, presentations, they're they're really commonly described, but they're they're hard to make sense of. I don't know what you what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I obviously like you know right now since there's so little research, I mean we're going off of you know anecdotal experiences, but I mean that theory would make a lot of sense because in the sort of, and I can only speak on my own experience. And, and I've, I, I mean, I've heard this from other PFS patients too, right? Is that when I first got hit with symptoms after I took the medication or used the medication rather, uh, you know, I was pretty distraught about the sexual problems. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, that was pretty, um, you know, traumatizing in a way. But I had it all together for that, you know, month and a half period. I had it all together mentally. I was doing fine otherwise. Um, and yeah, all of a sudden, just like you said, I mean, that, that's a good way of putting it, is that my brain just couldn't make sense of it anymore, couldn't handle it anymore. It, it's almost like it like short circuited and just completely freaked out. And from yeah. then on, it, it was just like this full frontal just assault on my on my body and mind, you know. And since that happened, like. How long did the crash last for? Are you still in the crash? Was there some trajectory of improvement, you know, after things got really bad for you? Yeah. So I would say I was pretty much in that period all throughout January and February of this pat of 2023. Um, you know, or around March, things started to sort of, I, I guess, stabilize a bit. 
Um, mm-hmm. You know, I've started, I was able to sleep. Um, you know, I was not having, you know, these just awful, like crying spells, it, like essentially for no reason. Right. I was just sobbing. I mean, it, it was almost like you would think that I just lost a family member or something like that, but that also went away. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's how it's kind of been ever since is like, that's all I can say really is that things have stabilized and, you know, I'm, I'm lucky in that I'm able to function and, and, um, you know, get through my day to day, but it's not anywhere close to who I was before all this, or, you know, how rich my life was before all of this happened, you know? Okay. Um, I think, I think now is probably a good time to talk about, you know, I want, I want to talk about the hymns workflow, you know, what was it like kind of going through that process to getting the medication? Just walk me through, um, you know, how the evaluation took place. I know you said you started it on your phone, you know, right. you were filling out something for, it sounds like the oral finasteride. You mentioned you had a mental health history. They directed you towards topical, which they suggested was lower risk. And I think that's where we left off. What, what happens, I guess, next in that kind of marketplace app type, um, you know, process? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's absolutely something I can go into. So, so really, uh, you know, I should say that what sets this, what, one of the early things you do is you send pictures of your hairline, the back of your head, the top of your head, just your whole hair apparatus, apparatus. I don't know. Um, you know, so they, they evaluate that. And, um, you know, then they set me up with, uh, I think it was a nurse practitioner for me, for some people, you know, it's a, it's a doctor. I think it varies, um, depending on person to person. Um, but, um, yeah, so, uh, basically I got matched with this person. Um, and, um, actually what happened first, and I think this shows like a glaring, um, problem in this, uh, new sort of dystopian get medication right to your door, you know, whole deal. So they told me that I can't take the oral because it could in, uh, increase, uh, or worsen, you know, some of my, uh, mental health symptoms. Um, and, uh, you know, I said, okay, you know, that's fine. I'll take the topical. Immediately after that, they start shipping me out the, the pills, which they said I could not take. And had I not, you know, stopped and said, hey, look, like this is not the right product, they would have shipped a product to me that they explicitly said is unsafe for me, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm like, hey, I don't think you're, this is what you wanted to send me. So they, you know, switched it. And um, yeah, from there, she uh, she didn't really tell me. So the actual medical professional I was speaking with did not indicate any side effects. Like I said, they just gave me a link to the label, which seemed very normal. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, in, in terms of its presentation, you know, it seemed like any other medication and it didn't have any, any, in, any indication whatsoever that any of the side effects that our experience could be persistent. Um, which, which label did they send to you? Because, um, I, I don't know if the topical is is truly a, um, a you know a standalone FDA approved medication. I, I mean maybe it is, but that my my understanding was it, it's like a compounded drug. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure about. They did yeah. say it's not uh, FDA approved um, yeah. on their website. I do have to obviously mention that, but uh, I if I remember correctly, it was just the standard finasteride sort of. Um, label sure. you know okay or, so they so they send that to you as part of the workflow the, the uh, to to look at and there was i mean was there and there was not any I, I guess from what you could recollect there wasn't anything in there about persistent sexual dysfunction yeah i actually i'll be honest before before i came on here about you know 20 minutes before this i went in and i wanted to make sure you know double check that there was no indication of persisting side effects or persisting symptoms rather. Right. Cause the word side effects, you yeah. know, implicates that you stop taking it and it goes away. Nothing at all about, um, 
persistent effects. And throughout this process, from the first time you click, you know, I'm interested, I want to book a consult for this topical product until, you know, when you're finally getting shipped the product and they send you the label, they both say that, you know, while the emerging evidence is not 100% concrete, uh, mm. it is our emerging evidence suggests that topical finasteride is much safer than the oral um, and it has less incidence of side effects. So I'll be honest, based on what was presented to me uh, during this, you know, it was like I, I felt like I had nothing to lose. And for example, I put an acne cream on my face every night, right? Uh, I, I was almost thinking of it in that way. There's no real indication that this is a very potent substance that you are applying topically, you know? And um, I guess the other thing that's interesting is, were you counseled on the risks at all by the nurse practitioner who you met with, or was it mainly like, oh, just read the label, I'll send it to you? It was exactly that that latter uh, experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, she she directly did not mention anything about really any side effects. They just sent me a link and said, Hey, make sure you read the link, you know? Um, so it was just like, I mean, they don't, they don't say anything, you know? And, um, let me see if I can pull up the, uh, conversation. So please make sure to read the link below to familiar, familiarize yourself with the benefits and risks. So let's have a look at this, uh, the risk language. Okay. So, um, yeah, okay, side this effects. is basically where you go into common side effects. So this is kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, I guess, I guess what they want to say that most people would, um, expect on the medication. And this is where they say, like, these are the serious side effects. Yeah. Sexual um, dysfunction, but nothing about it being enduring. So, so let's keep on going. Let's see what else. Right. Is in there. Um, they say treatment failure, uh, misdiagnosis, and then they tell you to share it with your, you know, real doctor. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, because the, the actual, let me see, I'm going to pull up hymns, then asteroid, um, information because I've actually poked around on their website. I did it after, you know, talking to Eric and, um, you know, for the oral version, their information actually does have stuff in there about permanent sexual dysfunction. You know, the, the, oh, really? for the oral, let me, let me, I'm, while I'm talking to you, I'm going to try and find it. Um, okay. And let's see. Actually, I don't know if it's, Okay. Um, it's a little tricky to, to, to bring up, but I'll talk to you about it from recollection. Yeah, they do because in the labeling right. for oral finasteride, there is a section in there where they talk about post-marketing reports of enduring sexual dysfunction. And to me, mm -hmm. that stuck out as interesting because I noticed the same thing that you just showed me because I also looked at the risk language for the topical after talking to Eric, that they make that distinction. They go, we don't, we're not going to, you know, on our website, we're going to talk about enduring sexual dysfunction, like for the oral, but not for the topical. Right. And I don't know if there's really a good rationale for doing it like that, you know? Um, and so, I mean, that's, that's something that's really interesting because I bet if you read that link and it said, Oh, by the way, there've been reports for persistent sexual dysfunction that might've weighed on, you know, the decision to take that medication for you. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I honestly, if somebody had indicated to me that, you know, it was even a remote possibility that I would have lasting effects from this, I mean, I wouldn't have taken it. But the way they market the topical is just like, it's like any other, you know, basic cosmetic product. I mean, you go on their website, it literally says, you know, this is the number one um, rated hair product of 2021 by Ask, Ask Men magazine or something like that. And it's like all of the benefits of oral finasteride without any of the hassle. And it, it, you know, they just make it seem like it's this very, you know, like, like as if you, you have nothing to lose by, by using this, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, and I and I have also seen some. Um, um, what is it? I, I I was watching the Huberman uh, podcast on sexual dysfunction, and he talks about when they have looked at the clinical pharmacology of the two products, and that you actually get you know, I mean, I haven't verified this, but I'll take his word for it that the systemic concentration right. of the drug in the serum is is a uh, comparable between taking it orally and taking it top topically. So, so the idea that it would just be limited to local side effects, you know, in the, in, in the hair. Um, right. I don't know if that makes sense as well. And I, I don't know if it even makes sense for the mechanism of a- action because it's a five alpha reductase inhibitor. And right. I, I don't think all of that's happening in the hair. Again, this is just me. Um, just, just kind of thinking out loud here. So I don't think that, Right. really makes sense. Um, well, the thing is too, is that, you know, obviously this is all anecdotal, but the thing is we get a lot of guys, you know, in this community who, you know, took it topically or used it topically rather, and are experiencing the same symptoms as somebody who took the pill. And I mean, that totally makes sense because it does seem like there's a systemic exposure with this. Um, <laughs> So yeah, t- so how many people have um, have have you come across in the community that that have gotten this from the topical? Honestly, I mean it's hard to say an exact number, but 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 quite a few. There's actually a guy, um, you know, who's within uh, basically the PFS Foundation has this like patient matching program, and there's a guy within. I haven't met him. I, I've only texted him briefly, but there's a guy within like a ten mile radius of me who's in the exact same situation uh, using the exact same product from the exact same company. Uh, you know, there's another guy I know um, in our, in our, uh, one of our fundraising groups right now who, you know, uh, use the, use the topical a few times and he's going through the same experience. So it seems like, you know, the, the, um, the marketing of topical finasteride as a, safe alternative to the oral pills um, is actually really unfortunately growing uh, the PFS community. Yeah, because yeah, they're trying to make it seem like it's less risky than it is. And right. um, I'd have to look into it to see if there's clinical trials. But you know what? I, so I, I know you had some questions about malpractice and, uh, and, and lawsuits and things like that. So so please, please. So it sounds like you're thinking about um, a, a, a legal action. Talk, talk me through that a little bit. Yeah. So you know, this uh, every time, and I'll and I'll kind of go into the context for this a bit later. But every time I talk to you know, just a lay person about this, the first thing is they they say usually is like, "Sounds like you have a case, man." You know, except uh, they say that, or more often they say, "There's no way." You know, "There's no way that happened to you," and things like that. But Um, yeah, so basically what happened is I was able to get my, if you go to them and say, look, I want my health records, they're legally obligated to give them to you. They're, they're internal health records, um, on your file. And, um, you know, so I did that, um, because I was doing a story with, um, the PFS foundation. Um, and basically I, I said, Hey, look, I want my, my records. And, you know, the first kind of screw up that happened was, you know, they were sending me a product that they, they were about to send me a product that they told me was going to be unsafe for me. And then the second thing that happened is, um, so what, what this nurse practitioner said to me is, Hey, look, uh, we're going to prescribe you this product. Um, I think the best sort of plan of action here is to focus on hair loss prevention, but also regrowth and the word regrowth is kind of key there because that implies that I've lost at least some hair. But when I go, I'm glad you brought that up because I'm, I'm looking at your hair right now. And unless it drastically improved, you know, following those doses of finasteride, you don't look like you're, um, you know, you're experiencing hair loss. Yeah. And that was primarily why I went into it. Right. It was a prevent it was really a preventative measure because, you know, like I said, all the males in my family are balding, but they, you know, this nurse practitioner said to me that, Hey, regrowth, is kind of a, a key uh, goal of this treatment here. So I'm like, okay, maybe it, maybe I've lost more hair than I think. But then when I got my records, she made an internal note 
that, and, and this is pretty much exactly what she said. They said, no thinning hair noted, right? So they're telling me that, you know, with the word regrowth, that I've lost hair. And then internally they're writing, um, you know, that I haven't lost any hair. Okay. So it's just, a, it's, it's, they're so selling did. me this product. Yeah. yeah, they're selling me this product when I didn't need it, even according to them, you know? So I'm going to show us a, a few things. So we're going to go here. So this is this is what you're looking at is the American drug label for finasteride tablets. And right. I think this is interesting. Post-marketing experience. This is This is the part. Sexual dysfunction that continued after discontinuation of treatment. So it's it's a fairly you know, it's in there in in the adverse reaction section. So so people right. should be aware of it. And then I think it's interesting how it gets translated over here and sexual dysfunction. And then when you come down here, this is it. This is the warning. Although uncommon, a small percentage of men may continue to experience adverse events after discontinuation of treatment. And I mean, to me, to describe it in this way, and maybe this is for, let's see. Okay, so it doesn't specify. It's, I guess it could be for the oral or the topical, but um, right. to describe it in that way almost seems like burying the lead, you know? I mean, you would probably know that men would be very concerned about permanent sexual dysfunction. And you might want to put that information together. You know, some men have reported sexual dysfunction. This has continued in a proportion of men, like the two sentences next to each other. It's, it's almost like even the way they kind of put it in their risk information, which is shared on their website, is, um, is, is uh, obfuscating what is a right. very clear risk. Right. Um, and, you know, I was able to do some digging and they do do they do have a, you have to search for it. Um, it's not visible on their site, but you look up, you know, post finasteride syndrome hymns and they have a whole blog post about it. And the whole thing is them just kind of discounting, you know, the experience and saying, you know, it's not, uh, you know, the science isn't good enough and blah, 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 blah. And it's still very safe, but according to the FDA, but, you know, it's, it's just like, you know, I mean, if I had known that this was even, and I think this is the case for most guys who take this, right? If they had known that there's even a remote chance that they're going to essentially lose their sexuality in many other parts of their life from, you know, in, in some cases, one pill, I don't think anybody would touch this with a, with a 10 foot pole, you know? Yeah. And it doesn't make sense for them as a company to be backpedaling on, um, you know, to, to be talking out of both sides of their mouth to say it is a risk, but at the same time, we don't think it's real because for something to even be in a drug label, and I know this because I used to work at the FDA and I've been at pharmaceutical companies, there needs right. to be a reasonable possibility of a causal relationship. So just by it being in there, it means that the regulators think that it's important enough, you know, and that the link is strong enough that physicians in the community need to know about this because for it to be in there, it means they think it's going to weigh on the risk benefit analysis that each doctor uses to decide if someone takes the drug. Um, right. And so to, to minimize it as well seems um, reckless and misleading. Um, so I think, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think you do have a case, you know, I, I think I would kind of follow this just based on, you know, what, on, on what you have. And um, I'm trying to think if I know a law firm in, in Illinois that I could refer you to, but I, I do think it's right. worth, you know, turning over this, this stone because you don't have hair loss uh, from, from what I can see. And it looks right. like they're just exposed to something dangerous. And then they had a whole bunch of uh, materials which obfuscated the risk, um, and, you know, there was real damage because of that. Right, exactly. And that's the big thing is like the, the contradictory information. It's like, why are you saying that I don't have hair loss on one hand and mm -hmm. then telling me, telling me that I do have hair loss? Like it's, it's, it's just really shady and, you know, that it, it's just so weird, you know. And I said, you know, I have a – I can see all their internal notes in my health records and even things like, you know, I said, yeah, I have some – 
history of, of mental health issues. And they're like, oh yeah, prescribe him. Make sure you, you know, try and sell him antidepressants as well. It's just, it's just all so weird. And it's like almost dystopian, you know? It is, it is dystopian. I mean, it sounds like you got put on like a conveyor belt towards getting, um, you know, just getting, getting a med- medication. And even though you didn't really need it, um, and it sounds like that was, that was, that was documented. So, um, right. Let, let me talk to some people. I'll see if I know any, any lawyers that do, um, this, this, this kind of work in Illinois. I think that would be sounds really good. interesting for you. Yeah. yeah um, for sure. We're, we're at about time uh, for today, but is there anything else that you, you, you wanted to share um, before we wrapped up? Yeah, I mean, I'd say that I just want to say that, I mean, I think this community faces a lot of backlash, especially in online communities. I mean, there's this there's so many people who I mean, honestly, like bully patients and, and, and say that this isn't real. It's, it's all in your head. Um, and the thing is, is that I, I don't, uh, I think it's because of a misunderstanding. I don't think that, you know, most PFS patients, like if, if this drug works for you, if you take it and it works for you, I think that's excellent and I'm happy for you. Um, but I just want to see my own body fixed. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think that's where most PFS patients are at, where it's like, I, I, if it works for you, I'm not trying to take it away from you, but I just want to see my own life repaired, you know? Yeah. Great. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. Um, I'm going to be in touch with you more after this and, um, even after that, just, just keep in touch and let me know how you go. And if, if there's other, if there's other PFS uh, folks in the community who who want to talk and share their story, I'd love to be a platform for them. I think this this kind of these kind of interviews are really important to just really describing the sim this, this, the conditions in ways that aren't conveyed in written text, which is how a lot of it is is done online. So um, yeah, I'd, right. I'd love to speak with uh, you know anyone who's willing to talk to me. Sure. I'll, I'll send some people your way. And uh, mm-hmm. I really appreciate you having me and, and giving us all this this uh, platform to talk about these horrible, uh, horrible experiences with these with these drugs. So thanks for that. It's my pleasure. Okay. All right. Thanks.